Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. All right, so one of the things that you will learn if you come listen to what Paul Scanlon says in a couple of weeks is about dressing for where you're going, not for where you've been. And uh, I'd like you to come and be interested in that. Also, huge thanks to our guys. I think they've done an amazing job every week on the music. We are, we're blessed with them. And also to those of you who've been very unwell today and are still here, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so I, I, was, um, I was listening to this Paul Scanlon message. It's quite it, the story of, of my finding it is quite interesting because it has a very specific connection to another event that happened that, that is another story in its own right. Um, but as Paul Scanlon goes through talking about this, what he calls the fifth season, which is the season of transition, he um, talks about his own journey and some of the challenges and, and some of the pains that, that um, he had to struggle through to, to, to get to where he was going. And uh, he said something at the end. He said, so there are some of you out there who know what I'm talking about. And he said, but what a difference a word makes. You, you just sometimes in the midst of it all, you, 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 you need a word to make sense of it all. And um, I thought, yeah, I, I relate to that very strongly. What was interesting is that as the message was finishing and as he was saying that, and I'm listening on the, on the laptop, the, um, um, my email pinged and an email came in right at that very moment. And uh, the email had nothing written on it except just this. This was the sole content of the email. Okay, no, hi, blah, 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 blah. This was the sole content. Isaiah 43, verse 18 and 19. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. That was it. That was the sole content at the very moment where Paul Scanlon had just said, when you are trying to make sense of this stuff, you need a word. I think that's a word, don't you? I think it's an important word as well. Now, it's always interesting to define how we arrived at the situations we find ourselves in. And it's actually very important that we take the time to think about that. Some of, some of you never do. And because of that, you struggle to make sense of things because you, you never try to define how you arrived at the situation that you have found yourself in. One of the saving graces for Chris and I in our life, and some of you know some of our journey, uh, was that we committed ourselves, both of us, to finding out how we arrived at the situation we found ourselves in. And that was a huge help to us finding wisdom and, uh, and healing in, in the way out. Because if you find the way in, you usually find the, the way out. Now, I appreciate there are always many factors that get us to the place that we find ourselves in. It's never just one thing. There are many factors that work together. Now, some we impose upon ourselves, and others are imposed upon us um, against our will. So it's a mixture of these things, and, and, and some things we need to sit and look and say, have I imposed this upon myself, and in what way have I created this situation? But also to have the broadness of thought, which, which we have to have, that, that, that some things are imposed upon us. We never asked for them, we never looked for them, and probably don't think we deserve them, and maybe didn't deserve them. Uh, but they were imposed upon us, and that can be anything from an attitude, a broken relationship, to, to abuse. The thing is that you cannot change how you got here or where you are. You can't change what has happened to you. You can't change why it happened to you. You can't change how it happened to you. 
I often say when people say, what's the definition of history? I say, history is the thing that delivered you to today. It might be good, it might be bad, it might have been helpful, it might have been obstructive, but your history is what delivers you to today. Now, I have to say in all honesty, that's probably the sum total of the value of history. It delivers us to today. And you can't change how you got here, you can't change where you are, but, but, but you can change where you will be, is what I'm proposing to you tonight. You can change where you will be. Nothing else can be changed, but you can change where you will be. We can change where we will be down the track from here. Now, there are four things from that word that I read to you earlier, four things that stand in the way of a new way which is what we're all looking for. And these are those four things. Number one, the problem of forgetting. Number two, the danger of dwelling. Number three, the challenges to seeing. And number four, the dilemma of which now. Now all these come from the scripture that we read, forget the former things. There, forget, don't dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? Making a way in the desert and streams and the wasteland. So I want to talk about those four things. The problem of forgetting. Um, cultures are very interesting and you will always conclude incorrectly what needs to be learned if you don't make space and time to understand the peculiarities of culture. I think the Bible is the most amazing book in the world. It's still the best seller, which is quite fascinating, really. And I don't think just because, you know, people have said, I'm Christian, I'm going to buy Bibles. I actually think it is a, it's an immense piece of literature in its own right. It's absolutely fascinating. And uh, being a student of the Bible, I, I think it's the most incredible piece of literature in that so many writers in so many different situations could write something that, if you know how to really look at it, is a continuing story. It's like, it's like Lord of the Rings trilogy times ten. And uh, as a person who slept through most of Lord of the Rings, every episode, because it's like, flip, this is a long film, what the dickens... The Bible can be a bit like that as well. But just like I give you space, like James Ledley, to like Lord of the Rings, you have to give me the same space to like the Bible, because I see the Bible in the same way as Lord of the Rings. Now, I think some of the things in the Bible, the way they're written up, are, have as about as much actual reality as Lord of the Rings, and other things have actual reality, and I'm not afraid to say that. But, but the reason I say that is that is that we've got to remember that this thing called the Old Testament, particularly because that, that transitioned a little into the New, was really a story written about the Hebrew people, who we now know as the Israelites, and it was written to the Hebrew people, who we know as the Israelites. Therefore, the things that it says and the concepts it presents are presented from a Hebrew cultural perspective, and of course with the Old Testament, an ancient Hebrew cultural perspective. And one of the fascinating things is how Hebrews viewed time. And this is very important in the context of the problem of forgetting. It's difficult for us to forget. We, we get so attached to what has happened and where we've come from, and when what, we find it difficult to forget the things we need to forget in order to find a, a new way. So, so here's how the, the Hebrew concept goes. In the Hebrew concept of time, the past is in front of you, the future is behind you, and you live in the present, okay? Hebrew time, the past is in front of you, you live in the present, the future is behind you. Now that's the exact opposite to Greek thinking which most of us have been raised with. But actually, it's much wiser than Greek thinking <coughs> and understands the concept of what time really is and how we work within time far better than any Greek philosophical viewpoint for this reason, in the Hebrew mind, you might think that's really stupid. How can the future be behind you 
and the past in front of you. It's very simple. This is the simple Hebrew wisdom, also working that time was not linear, time is cyclical, and that heaven and earth operate together. It's not you come here and you come into life and you get to the end and here is heaven, but there are two things that work side by side, another wonderful understanding and story for another night. But if you think about it, it's very sensible because you can see the past. Therefore, the past must be in front of you. You cannot see the future. Therefore, the future must be behind you because you can only see that which is in front of you. Now, if some of you would grasp this, it's going to help you to understand some other things. So when you say to a Hebrew, repent, he's not thinking, I have to be sorry for my sins. A Hebrew's thinking, I have to stop looking at what is in front of my eyes, my past, and I have to turn to see that which I do not know, the future. So repentance is I refuse to let what I see, which is the past, define what will be, which is my future. If you understand that, the problem of forgetting gets much simpler. Because when I say to you, repent, I'm not talking about you being sorry for sins that you have been committed. I'm saying all that stuff is messing you up and it's stopping you having a new way. Repentance is to say, I now will no longer look at the past to determine my view and my philosophy of life and my spirituality. I'm I'm turning from that. I'm turning into the mystery of that which cannot be seen, but knowing that it is revealed as you walk into it. See, if you don't understand this, your future will always be shaped by your past. Always, always, always. Some of you wonder why your future is taking the shape it is. Because it's being shaped by your past. Because you're still looking at your past. If you don't understand this, it will dominate and dictate everything that you do and every decision that you make. So everything I do, every decision I make, if, if, I, if I don't know how to forget, is being dictated and determined by everything that has happened. And it doesn't make for a new way in life. That's why in the ancient story of the Bible, God said to one of the key characters, Abraham, leave your country, your people, your father's house, and go to a land that I will show you. Nothing more than that. He didn't know what the land was. He didn't know where the land was. He just knew a direction. But one thing he did know is that he had to forget. The influence of father's house, which is dominant, the influence of the culture of people, and the bondage of of being part of a country set up, he had to totally set free from that. You can't do it while you're still looking at that stuff. The problem of forgetting. You have to turn around and walk away in your mind. You do that before anything else. You have to turn around, walk away in your mind. I'm going to ask you to do something. Some of you think this is spooky, but it's not spooky. It's helpful. I want you to just close your eyes just for a minute. Now, you don't have to. Some of you might be, you know, sometimes you do this in the congregation. People go, well, that's up to you. I don't care. For those of you who are interested, just, just close your mind right now. I, I, close, your, close your eyes right now. I, and I want you to see the things that are visible to you about your past. The things that irritate you, hurt you, demean you, bind you, frighten you. The things that are ruining you. The, the, the things that, that, that play havoc with your emotions. I want, I want you just, just to see those things now, but now I want you to, in your mind, I want you to turn around. In your mind, I want you to see yourself. I want you to see all that stuff as a pile, okay? There's the criticism I've had. There's the disappointments. There's the disillusionment. There's the abuse. There's the rejection. I want you to see that as a pile. But now in your mind... I, I want you to see yourself turning around and walking away. See yourself actually walking away from that stuff. Imagine walking away, leaving all that stuff behind. That's the Hebrew concept. The future is behind you. All that stuff is in front of you. So so turn around and walk away from it. Walk away from it first 
in your mind, because when you are renewed in your mind, you're transformed in your life. Okay? Right, you can stop. Keep walking in your head if you want. Some of you be like, I'm running. The problem of forgetting stands in the way of a new way. And then the second one was the danger of dwelling. Dwelling. How much time do we spend dwelling on stuff? Come on, be honest. We dwell on it. We dwell on the things that have happened. We dwell on our thoughts. We dwell on what's happened to us. We dwell on what's happening around us. We dwell on stuff. Is that, is that right or not? We, we dwell on stuff. Well, dwelling is another of the problems because forget the former things, right? Learn to forget because we have a problem forgetting. And do not dwell on the past. But how many of us actually dwell on the past? And the past is everything from the second I just said to you about dwelling on the past all the way back and we dwell on it, we dwell on it. Just like some people will be dwelling on the fact today that I said something about potentially not being here and some people will dwell on that and it will stop them moving forward. Don't dwell on the past. Because here's the deal, here's the danger of dwelling from two angles. One is nostalgia. Dwelling in the past with nostalgia is just as damaging as dwelling in the past, poking around painful memories. Both have the same impact, but one masks itself better than the other. Nostalgia, you know what nostalgia is? It's warm feelings about the past. It's the golden era that never really existed because our brains only pick out the positive experiences. But, oh, I remember when the church was X. We only pick out the positive experiences. I'm the other way. I've always remembered who said what and who did what and who didn't come and, and who I was struggling with at the time. I have, my memories go the other way. It's not very nostalgic. But nostalgia is a comforting companion but a poor friend. Because nostalgia makes you feel, oh, wasn't it lovely when? But it's not a very good friend. Because nostalgia will never say, but do you remember all the stuff that was going on around that? Do you remember what happened when all that was going on that wasn't so pleasant and wasn't so nice and we're struggling and battling against? Nostalgia is a comforting companion, but it's a poor friend because it won't speak to you honestly about the past. Nostalgia never faces you up with the wider truth or the whole story. There are some people we have in our community of people here who are very nostalgic but nostalgia never faces you up with the wider truth or the whole story. It only ever selects the bits that it wants to see. Now, I must say something in defense of pastors here. Is that okay? Being a pastor. It's always fascinated me that when somebody gets upset in a church environment, I think it's probably the same in a political environment or any kind of community, it's always fascinating that people's conclusion is something must have happened to them for them to have taken that action. But never thinking they may have done something to others that is causing that action. So it's never, it's always something must have happened to them because the lovely people, never something might have been done by them. And you need to wise up because nostalgia will do that. How many of you know that the murderer next door, when people are interviewed for the paper, say, oh, he's such a lovely guy. You know, he was so sweet. He was a fantastic neighbor. Meanwhile, he's done 15 murders. You know, I mean, do you understand that often our reading of things can be driven by nostalgia. We pick out the nice bits, and that does not help us in the context of where we dwell, the danger of dwelling in the wrong place. Now, let me flip the coin over to the other side. The danger of dwelling also on things that are painful to us, not pleasant, but painful. Consistently poking around the painful never allows it to heal. It only ever justifies my reaction. It never paralyzes or sterilizes the problem. But how many times do we poke around the painful because we dwell there? And then all our reaction we see as a reason why I should be poking around the painful 
because it's painful, but what I'm really saying is, I don't want to have a new way, but you see, if we want to have a new way, not only do we have to deal with the problem of forgetting, we have to deal with the danger of dwelling. And what you have to do is reach out in the heart and move on in the mind. What do I mean by reach out in the heart? You have to reach out in the heart to something bigger than your pain, something greater than your circumstance, that has healing within it. Your heart must be reaching out for that solution. And I believe God is that. I believe that's what Jesus was all about, and I believe that's why his spirit is here with us for that reason. But you reach out in the heart, and then you have to move on in the mind. So if you're going to reach out in your heart, you can't dwell on it in your mind. You have to then let your heart receive what it is that your heart is reaching out for, and stop dwelling on it in your mind. That's where transformation occurs. Paul wrote in in Romans chapter 12, and be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So what we think and how we think is very important in this process of dealing with the problem of forgetting and the danger of dwelling. The third one, the challenge to seeing. Distractions divert the focus. Again, let, let me talk from a personal level. Some, some of you cannot see what we're trying to do or where we're heading or who we're trying to reach. And so we have this problem of the challenges of, of seeing. And, and, and one of the problems of the challenges of seeing, Jesus addressed this, this question on at least a couple of occasions. And one of them was that he said, there's something in your eye. And until you deal with what's in your eye, you're always going to fail in the challenge to see. Now, here's how Jesus put it a couple of ways. One was, how can you point out the speck in someone else's eye when you have a plank in your own? Now, the reason Jesus said that was because when most of us are pointing out the speck in someone else's eye, it's a sure indicator that we have a plank in our own. And sadly, if we don't have a a, a corporate view of life and we don't give everybody grace and everybody forgiveness and everybody accessibility to love and kindness, actually what we start to do, we start to pick out the people who we think deserve it and the people who we think don't. Do you know what happens then? You have made yourself bigger than God. Because God says this is for everybody, but you says this is for some people, and I don't like some people because they don't do what I'd like them to do. That's called a plank in your own eye when you are criticizing others. Now, of course, the problem is it's always, well, I'm only, I only said they've got a speck in their eye. That doesn't excuse it, because what it is, it's saying other people are not seeing correctly, when Jesus' point is, if you're going to talk about people not seeing correctly, you're the one who's not really seeing correctly, so he said, first remove the plank from your own eye, before you try to remove the speck from your brothers. Good lesson. Very helpful. How do you see? What do you see in other people's eye? The moment you see the speck, you're probably indicating that you have the plank. In the same way that Jesus said, let him who is without sin be the first to cast a stone. Once you decide to cast a stone at anybody, you are declaring, I'm without sin. Both of those situations are challenges to seeing. Then Jesus said another thing, which is interesting. He said, He said on one occasion, he said, the prince of this world had blinded your eyes. And on another occasion, he said, you have blinded your own eyes. On both occasions, it was unless you see and repent and be converted. Unless you do that change that we talked about the beginning, you have blinded your own eyes. And it's by two things. Here's how I define them. You've either blinded your own eyes by, by power at work, And I don't necessarily mean the devil when he says the prince of this world. I don't know what your prince of this world is, but we all have a prince of this world that is the thing that dominates us and speaks to us, and we do listen to that sometimes more than we listen to God. And it blinds our eyes to what is necessary to find a new way, okay? Yeah, I want to bring you back. See, I am doing a new thing. If you can't see that he is doing a new thing, you have either blinded your eyes by what you put first, 
Or the other thing is, your eyes have been blinded by in an act of self-preservation. Because Jesus said, you've blinded your eyes and you've put your fingers in your ears because you know that if you really saw what you're supposed to see and you really heard what you're supposed to hear, you would have to change and you don't want to change. So here's this little lesson to the new way. Open your eyes, open your eyes wide. Open your eyes in wonder. Open your eyes in grace. Be willing to see it all, the good and the bad. Because if you don't have a plank in your eye, he said, what you will see is that I am doing a new thing. That God is doing something in the midst of that. Okay, so the problem of forgetting, the danger of dwelling, the challenges of seeing. We've got one more, the dilemma of which now? There are two nows. There's the now of your present circumstances and there's the now of God. And the two, unfortunately, are very often not the same thing. And the now that we mostly live in is the now of our present circumstances, which are influenced by the things that we've talked about, the challenges to see, the danger of dwelling, the problems of forgetting create our now. And when we live in that now, that is the now of our present circumstance. And while we live there, we don't live in the now of God. And this whole message is about shifting to live in the now of God. I will do a new thing. Right? Forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. I will do a new thing. This is where I want to bring you to tonight. So in the two nows, the now of your present circumstance and the now of God, if you simply accept the now of your present circumstances... You will live only within your now. And that's the issue. You will live only within your now. This is what my circumstance is now. But if you live in the now of God, you empower a force able to affect your present now in a remarkable way. I am proposing to you that there is a power in the now of God that is contrary to the now of our circumstance. Now our circumstance may be part of that journey, but if we live in what that circumstance says, is this is now, we only live within the bondage of what we talked about at the very beginning. We look at our past and the future is behind us. What's in our view is what has gone. That dictates everything. But the whole point is, as we repent and turn into the mystery of the wisdom of the future that you cannot see, and therefore, moving into what you cannot see, you have no frame of reference. And if you try to impose a frame of reference upon the process that is the now of God and the future, you simply recreate the past in the future. So instead of doing this and walking into the future, you do this. And Jesus one day said to the religious people, he said, you have stumbled over the stumbling stone. Now again, culturally that doesn't mean much to us. It meant a lot to them. What he was saying is that Jesus had come to be an obstacle to their view of life and their religious process. And he said, you keep falling over Jesus. Jesus makes you fall over and you think this has to be wrong. What's going on? If this was Jesus, I wouldn't be stumbling. We wouldn't be falling. We wouldn't be having trouble. But you see, the reason you're stumbling over it is because you are walking into the future while facing backwards. So all this stuff, the nostalgia, the hurts, the pains, the circumstances are simply dictating this and you keep falling over something, but all you do is get up, but you're still looking the same way. Turn around. It's a song about that, isn't it? See, the now of God is where I'm trying to bring you. I believe that when we truly embrace that mystery of this future of forget the former things, don't dwell on the past. I find that so hard. I don't know about you. I'm preaching this as much to me as I am to you. Forget the former things. Who am I going to blame? And that's another good message about scapegoating. Who's going to be my scapegoat? Well, if we really get this right, you don't need a scapegoat because, because now you can't see the past. See, see before, 
the past is in front of you, but when you turn to face the future, you can't see the past because the past is behind you. You know that you've truly embraced the now of God when the past is behind you and you can't see it. You might still hear it. You might see the odd reflection of it and it might cast some shadows past you as you walk, but you can't see it. It's not dominating what you see. It's not dictating who you are. I want us to be like that as a church as well. Thank God for all that's been, but thank God it's over. You live in the now of God, you empower a force able to affect your present now in a remarkable way. God's now is this. Let me just give you three quick things and then I'll shut up because you've said enough. Just, just three quick kind of little pokes into Scripture of God's now. Uh, and what's interesting is that um, in our scripture we read, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, something different, I am doing a new, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up, okay? When? Now. Now it springs up, and what is it? It's a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. It's a way in your wilderness... And it's streams flowing into your lack is what is promised. But it's I am doing a new thing, now it springs up. So here's what's interesting from Scripture. Okay, I am. It's interesting that I am is the name for God in Scripture. Whenever you see a declaration of I am, that's why Jesus said I am. Whenever Jesus said I am, the resurrection and the life, I am the way, the reason they hated him is because I am was a declaration that God was here. And God was here now. And it's still the same. So when you read here, I am, it's interesting that I am is the name for God. He said, I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. Now, can you believe that he is making a way in the desert and producing streams in the wasteland, in your wasteland? A way in your desert and streams in your wasteland. Can I believe that? Can we believe that as a house? But we're only going to get there, not by going back to the former things, but by forgetting the former things, and not dwelling on the former things, but realizing that we have been empowered to move forward, providing we deal with the problem of forgetting, the danger of dwelling, the challenges of seeing, and the dilemma of which now. Your life might depend on this choice. So here's, here's the little scripture slots before we finish. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2 says, Now is the day of salvation. When is the day of salvation? Now. When is now? Now is now. Therefore, if I live in God's now, what is now? It's the day of salvation. So when is the day of salvation? Now, it's not something you move from or move towards or try to accomplish, it's always now. So you say, well, why am I not always seeing the salvation of God? Salvation is to save from and into. Why is that not always manifest? Because you're living on the now of your circumstances, therefore you don't see salvation present. But when we live in God's now, we have this awareness that salvation is with us. It's not something that I raised my hand, I said, Jesus, come into my heart, and now I'm saved. Salvation is always now, in the present. Now is the day of salvation. Hebrews 4 verse 7. It's this whole thing about the children of Israel moving into a promise and a place of rest. And it says, therefore, God again set a certain day because he said, today if you don't harden your hearts you'll make it. So one thing I have to do if I'm going to live in today is not have a hard heart. How do we have a hard heart? Because we're seeing the past. We don't forget. We dwell on it. We don't see. We don't live in God's now. So what happens? We have a hard heart. Because we have a hard heart, we can't experience that today. But it says, but God made a day. And he called it today and said, today, if you will hear my voice. Here's the wonderful thing. 
God wants to get us out of our linear calendar thinking. It doesn't say God made the day and called it Sunday, or God made the day and called it Saturday and said, if you'll turn up on a Saturday, or if you'll be there on a Sunday, he says, God made a day and he called it today and said, today, if you will hear his voice, God's now is today is the point that I'm making. It's not something that we have to attain or achieve or move to. It's something you enter into which exists this moment. Now is salvation. Now is God's today. God made a day specifically for you and me and says, I'm calling it today. So that today, if you hear it, so right this moment, we have the opportunity to live in that, in that, um, in God's now. And one last one, Hebrews 11, verse 1. I love it, particularly in the the old New King James, the King James. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What did we say the future is? It's what's hoped for. It's the things not seen. But there's something interesting because it says now faith is what makes that substance. Now faith. Now faith. It's the actual embracing now of the wonderful truth that we are living in the now of God which exists correspondingly with the now of our circumstances but we can make a choice as to which now we are living in. So which now are you living in? Because it's a dilemma. And there's so much about our now that we don't want to let go. Because too many of us are defined in our character, our behavior, who we are by our now. But if we forget the former things, if we don't dwell on the past, if we see God is doing something different, and if we move into that now, it means we have to leave all those excuses and reasons and issues and things we want to dwell on. But the question is, is it worth it? Well, Either this is a lie or it's true. And the suggestion is that if you will do that, you find a way in your desert and streams in your wasteland and we find the rest that we were looking for and we become light and help and hope to each other and to the world. Four things that stand in the way of a new way. Are you willing to forget? Are you willing to stop dwelling? Are you willing to start seeing? Are you willing to embrace God's now? If you are, I prophesy to you, what you're going to start to see is a way in the wilderness. I like, I like the phraseology the Bible uses. It's very poetic. It doesn't say, you know, a way to the chip shop. You know, calling it Asdron. It, it really does use language to try and get through to us that that for so much of our life that is kind of wilderness because of its dictator, that's where the way will be. That's the way. It's not just the way to come to church, you know, the way to know a few Bible verses, but an actual seeing a way in our wilderness, seeing a way in our life, seeing a direction, seeing a purpose, seeing a point and streams. Something that flows into that desert place that actually is the sustaining power and the help that takes you on. Too much dwelling on the past. Too much remembering of what has been. Not enough forgetting. Not enough refusing to dwell. Not enough willingness to see. Not enough willingness to enter into God's now. But we are going to change that, aren't we? And I want you to decide, if you're going to change it tomorrow, you're not going to change it. How many of you have ever, ever enter the tomorrow. You never have. When does tomorrow start? So, well, it starts a minute after midnight. Okay, well, tell me, a minute after midnight, is that tomorrow? No, a minute after midnight is today. So, anything that we say tomorrow will never become a reality because tomorrow doesn't exist. Tomorrow is just a phrase about another today. We have to live it in today. So I'm saying today, if you hear his voice. Today, if you get a hold of this. Today is when we make the decision to do this. Today is when we walk away from all that stuff that's been dictating us. Today is the day that we listen to proper Hebrew thinking on time and say that was in front of us. And that's what we can see. But actually, what we can't see that is behind us is the place that we are heading 
So I say in closing, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing, says God. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. Father, as we come before you tonight, I thank you that in what you've given us in the context of our mind, that we can renew our mind, we can change our thinking, we can set our course in a different direction. And you said that that's the place of transformation. I pray that transformation will flow out of this building tonight. Incredible transformation. Wildernesses that are no longer scary, but a path that can be seen. Water flowing in to sustain and bring life. Because we heard what you said, and I believe your wisdom. So let it flow through this house. Let it become part of our hearts. Let it become part of our lives. And may we tonight have truly repented, turned around, and now be living in the now of God, in the transforming power, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, guys. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support The Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.